It's hard to believe it just a few weeks ago this was a water damaged camper. Welcome to the Warrior Wood Shop. On this episode, we're going to show you how we got this utility trailer from a water damaged hybrid camper. The frame of that camper was about 18 foot long. We shortened it to 16 foot because of the weight balance issue. It worked out real well for our decking because decking boards come in 16 foot lengths. Now, is it worth it to take and that free or cheap camper that's water damaged and turn it into a utility trailer? The disposal process, teardown process, might seem fun at first, but it's a lot more work than you anticipate. I had over a hundred dollars in just disposal fees plus time. You got to have the location. You got to have a way to deal with the mold, the mildew, and just think about: Are the tanks emptied out? However, we bought this one water damaged on purpose. Yes, on purpose, because we were building a cargo trailer toy hauler project. What that means is all the appliances in this camper were working, the refrigerator, the air conditioner, the furnace, the windows were in good shape. So we used all of those appliances and other parts of that camper to com basically make our cargo trailer into a toy hauler. That left us with a stripped down frame. Once you get to that point, it's awesome. So again, if you can find someone that's already done that work and just pay a few hundred dollars, it might be worth it in the long run to you. From that point, we added cross rails because there's never enough on a camper frame to support this kind of weight. We added side rails, stake pockets, the fenders, did all the wiring and the bonus on this one is we did all the wiring in conduit. So there's no exposed wires or 99% no exposed wires. So when you're in an environment like this you're going through dips and possible you know ruts and trees and debris. We're not worried about our wiring getting snagged on mud, snow, water, twigs, branches, whatever we're going across with on the highway or even in the off-roads like this. So we're going to show you how we ended up with this by starting with that hybrid camper. So let's let's get started. All right, we're here at Davis Trailer. That's the first stop here in Arnold. I want to give a shout out to them because they are awesome at what they do. Small business at its finest. What they're going to do here is give the internal components a once over. Obviously, you can see that the tires are good, but they're going to check the axles and bearings out. I know this thing towed great. I pulled it about 100 miles. Other than being lightweight and bouncing around because there's no weight to it, I had no problems towing it. So I think we're going to get a thumbs up. All right, one of the things we have to think about is safety. Duh, we're on a shop, right? No, we're talking safety when this trailer is built. You ever heard of the death wobble or the tail wagging the dog when it comes to trailers? That is because people put too much weight on the rear of the trailer and it actually takes weight off the truck and makes the back end wobble. Bounces up and down. Please, I'm gonna delete any comments that say how to solve that problem. The best way to avoid that problem is to put 60 to 70% of your weight in front of the axles, in front of the center line of the axles and 30 to 40% behind it. Well, the ratio of this trailer is about 50-50. That is a dangerous combination because you would put one side-by-side -side up front, one side-by-side -side in the back, that would be a 50-50 ratio, and you would be asking for disaster potentially. I've been there once in my trailer driving life. They loaded all the paperwork from this business I was hauling on the back of the trailer because it was last minute stuff. It was the longest 400 miles of my trip I couldn't, or of my life because I couldn't go over 50 miles an hour. There was no way to reposition the weight. I've had situations before where I felt it, so we pulled over in the rest area and rearranged stuff on the trailer. We fixed the problem you know, in a safe place. I couldn't do that that one time I'm referring to. So I've got it marked out and it's cut 28 inches off the back. That'll leave us enough room to drive a four-wheeler up sideways on the rear if we needed to, which means the side-by-side -side goes up on the front, keeping the weight up there. It works out real well. So, do you want to cut the back off? We are. You do you. It comes down to safety on the road, your liability, your conscience, and your 
family safety while you're driving down the road. To me, it's worth it to cut that two foot off and make everything go coincide 16 foot lengths. So we'll get into the shop and we'll start by cutting the tail end off. So here's the game plan for the trailer. Again, we've already discussed that we need to shorten the frame by 28 inches. And to help stabilize it where we cut, we're going to put a 2x2 two two angle iron, which will connect the two rails. After that, we'll add our bumper and joists. Then we'll add the rim joists or rim rails, whatever you want to refer to them as. That's the 5 inch flat bar. Next, we'll add a headache rack or a front stop. Add some rails or tracks for the ramps to be stored underneath the trailer. Add some stake pockets and the fenders. And then finally put a treated deck down. So that's the game plan to get this trailer from the camper frame up to a completed utility trailer. We're going to take a sawzall and see how well we can do. You can also use a grinder with an angle, a cutting wheel. So let's get a piece of 2x2 two two cut and put it on, weld it onto the back. So now we got to figure out how long we're going to make our inch and a half square tubing. And I've got a position where I measured from the outside of the frame to the outside of the uh, torsion bar. And that's five and three quarters. So that's what I'm making the overhang match. And then I'm measuring to the wheel. That's eight. So by the time we take off the quarter inch for the outside, We'll be right about seven and a half, seven and three quarters, and the fender seven, so that works out really well. So now I'll just go to the other side and transfer that measurement to get a length. So there's my five and three quarters. And then, since it hasn't moved, we're at 71 inches total for all our cross members. All right, the key to making these things on center is knowing the thickness of your material. So it's three uh, inch and a half total. So we're going to go back three quarters and forward three quarters of 24. So basically the center is on our 24 mark. And that's where we're going to put our cross member. We're just going to continue that along the way. Now that we got our two foot centers marked out, next thing to do is just get them in place, get them tacked up. All right, to make space a little bit easier, I've got this five and three quarter block because that's what the overhang is. Just use that as a guide to get everything tacked. Just like anybody, I want to get into building and we've had an awesome four or five hours today. One of the things, just in the anxiousness to get started, I didn't talk about spacing of the cross members. Yes, you saw me lay them out 24 inches on center. 
That's because we plan on going with 2x8 or 2x10, if we have to, 2x12 material. So when that's milled out at the lumber mill, it comes out to an inch and a half. 24 inches on center will work for those. Structurally, it's capable of taking that. 16 would be if you needed that to be extra strong. That would just add more weight. And since we're only hauling ATVs and just as a utility trailer, we really didn't need that extra strength and added weight to the trailer. That is where if you're exceeding 16 foot, you're gonna to have to know where your seam boards are gonna be or seam joist. Other than that, they can go as long as anywhere they want as long as they don't exceed 24 inches from the next one. Okay, another popular deck surface is, and it's probably the most economical, is the five quarter decking. So it's only an inch to an inch and an eighth thick. And we're, I use that a lot on the 6x12s, 5x8s, those smaller trailers, the pop-up trailers, because they're not a heavy frame. Um, it's actually the least expensive for the square footage, but you got to put more boards on. And on a bigger trailer, I like the look of 2x8, 2x10s that way. With a, but back to the 5 quarter board, your max is 16. All right, we're back for day number two. Just got back from the chop saw to cut this cap rail to length. Basically, it's a piece of angle iron. It's going to connect to the front joist and allow the lumber to slide underneath. And then I like to, I don't like to just open this here, kind of, so this hangs below. I'm going to use this, uh, well, makeshift frame left over to kind of fill the gap in, do a little polishing and grinding. And, that should look like it was meant to be, and then throw the toolbox on, it'll all finish out pretty well. So what we've got is this box out of a pickup truck where the welds have started to crack from hanging. So it'll work really perfect here on the front of the trailer. You know, for helmets, straps, chains, whatever we want to use to tie stuff down. So it'll work out real well. What we've got is a lip that's eight inches above. That's going to put this about 12 inches, which is kind of the average 10 to 16 is where most headache rack are on a trailer, depending on what they're hauling. They usually typically match the fender height. However, our fender height's only going to be three to four inches, so we want to go a little higher than that. All right, one of the things I like to do is be frugal, not low quality, not cheap. Just try to save money in every way we can. So this is some scrap left over from a, a teardown project. This is the inch and a half tubing that we were using for our floor joists. If I didn't have this piece, I would have just 45 the corners and, and made another piece going around. But again, a lot of it's going to be hidden by this rack. I have to have this piece. So, you know, tear down, free, whatever you want to call it, way cheaper than having to pay for my material. What I'm going to run into, though, is I've got three quarters and inch and a half. So I'm going to do it in the woodworking world, we call a rabbit. So I'm going to notch this. I'll have to set in there so we don't have an open end showing. Some of the biggest challenges are trying to figure out when you're working by yourself how to deal with situations like this. So just holding things up. Get creative. You're gonna have to figure out your situation. So it is what it is. That's the basic front end. Um, some people will build a box so the toolbox will drop into it. We're just going to put some washers and self-tappers into the frame here. I've had pretty good luck with that. Headache rack or stop bar, toolbox rack, takes care of the front end. We'll keep working our way back. Uh, when we come back tomorrow, we're going to work on the fenders. We're back. We're ready to put the fender on. So I've got four by four small blocks set on, on top. Uh, that usually leaves about two to three inches of clearance to rise and lower. I've got the same amount of distance in the back, so if somebody did want to put 14s or 15s on this, we could still do it. And I've got my vice grips that are holding everything in place. We also don't have a back on this, so we're going to use this piece of angle iron 
Plus, it'll, right where we seamed the two uh, outside rails, that'll catch them both together. And then you'll see here in a second, it's going to give me a spot to weld the flat plate and put a D-ring on the inside of the fender. If you're new to welding, this is one of the tougher parts of trailer building because you got a thin metal, usually against a thicker metal, so you might want to practice with some scrap. Just get to know your welder, get to know your material, and hopefully not blow it all through. That adds a lot of strength to the fender. Give it a little bit of flex here, we'll take care of that with a diagonal brace. All right, all this flat bar is do is keep this from flexing a little bit right in the middle. And the nice thing is you need to be close, but you don't have to be exact. But as you can tell, uh, everything's welded on here now. I mean, not that I would stand on this fender. It, it is only, you know, 10 or 12 gauge, maybe 14 sheet metal anyways. But you can see I got good penetration because I've got the color coming through. All right, my method of madness for racing the fenders. One of the things I do not understand, and even professional trailer manufacturers do this, is when they put the angle iron facing forward. That creates a drainage point or a drip point, catch point, whatever you want to call it right here. I like to put the angle iron so it's facing backwards is what I call it. And that creates a tight seam in here. Plus, you know, block there. You could add lights, you could add markers, you could add reflectors. But what I'm gonna do is cut this at about a 45 degree angle and put one of those, what they call penny lights, three quarter lights. Because I don't know, you know, your trailer towing experience at night or backing at night, trying to find a black fender at night on the highway is a challenge. So having that little marker light is a huge benefit. In fact, on some of my bigger trailers, I'll even put a turn signal right here in the middle, but obviously we couldn't do that on this trailer. So what I'm going to do is very scientific measuring here. Put that up against my frame, and right where the curve starts, I'm going to mark it. But I'm going to come back at a 45. So I'll check that with my speed square. I'm going to cut that. I'll be right back. Take a piece of 8 by 2 and cover that up. That allows us to run a piece of wire loom or something inside of here and it's always protected. Uh, a lot of times one of my tricks is to weld a washer underneath so that way the wire can go through it. You know, it's, and that'll allow me to drill a hole and put a, a dime light in there or a penny light. And that gives me a spot to put that penny light right there. Now when it comes to the back side, you can reverse the process. But in this case, we're just going to have a straight cut because we know we're putting a light box that's going to extend out the width of the fender, so really we don't need the rear marker because it's going to be on the light box in the back. But if you're going to put your tail lights in the rear of the trailer, like in the framing, then you're going to need a, legally you'll need a marker light, depending on which state you're in, at the widest point of the car. All right, here we are. We're going to work on the back. It's a little tight to work on the other fender right now, so we'll kind of work our way around and then move the trailer over and be able to get to that fender. So, but if you notice, since the start of the video, something's changed. This piece of angle iron to tie the supports together has actually been flipped and rotated to the inside. And that's because instead of using this big, heavy 3x5 tubing, we're just gonna go with a flat bar and put light boxes on the inside. And we're gonna put a couple of light boxes on the outside. Weight, uh, what I had available, uh, just cost of materials, a few things went into that. So let's get this tacked up and we'll show you how, you know, how we do the light boxes a little bit later. Alright, one of the things that you inevitably run into when you're using a trailer is how you hold your stuff down. And I think Murphy's Law says you always want to tie it down between the fenders. And these fenders are not strong enough to wrap a strap around. So since we already had a angle iron vertical support here, 
I kind of made it an enclosed triangle by putting this piece of flat bar on top of it. What that's going to allow me to do is take one of these weld on D rings and have a spot right here in the middle. There we are. Sorry about the lighting. I've got to work with the garage door open for ventilation reasons. But one of the things that comes with towing and experience in towing is I definitely want this toolbox, but it's going to make it a challenge to tie anything down up front. So what we're going to do is we're add, since we added this cap rail to help seal the end of the board to keep them from getting absorbing water, that allows us a perfect spot to attach some additional D-rings. That way when you bring that one four-wheeler up or the side-by-side -side up, you got a spot to tie it down. And we'll show you what we're going to do on the side, but you could add them to the side. We're going to do stake pockets and rub rails instead. But for the front, the back, and the fenders, I like to use the D-rings. All right, now we're going to move. We've, we've taken and attached our D-rings up to the front and on our fenders. And now we're going to move on to our attachment points for the side of the trailer. And we've chosen to use a stake pocket and rub rail method that we use on a lot of other trailers. So you can see this is what I started out with. We cut it into three and a half inch sections. And the D-ring pulls on one particular point. That's why you need to match them up with your cross members. So that way it's pulling on a structural point and not the outside rail of the trailer. The advantage to the stake pockets and rub rail method is you get the pressure distributed amongst the whole side of the trailer. Plus when you're hauling things, like I plan on using this trailer for more than just four wheelers, picking up lumber from the lumber yard, crates, boxes, things like that, I have basically an infinite spot to strap across the trailer with having that rub rail. So there's plenty of advantages. So the next step is to get the two inch by quarter lined up. So I choose to follow the bevel of the fender, make it look a little better. All right, here, here's one of my uh, tricks of the trade, methods of madness. What I do is I got it clamped up to where it's touching the bottom. And then I just measure across the top. You can't lay the tape measure flat. You got to lay it on edge like this, or you can use a steel ruler. And that is one and seven sixteenths from where it touches to there. So that means I need to, to measure one and seven sixteenths back, angle, cut that maybe a little bit of a curve and that should help match that up we're using these light boxes we got four inch round lights from another project i've had to strategically make a hole in the side of the box and match it up with a hole in the frame so that way my wire grommet can go through and everything's enclosed in the box and doesn't get caught up in the gravel the sticks the debris the road the mess I'm really big about boxing up the wiring. You'll see that as we finish up the trailer. Got a couple stake pockets, and then we'll do the rail. So let's get started. All right, once this side cools down, tomorrow we'll come back and clean everything up and just repeat the procedure the other side. We're not gonna film that again because you've seen how it's done. It's just a mirror copy. Now hopefully you can see why, how this is working out. We're going to put a marker light on the outside here, and then this four inch box, the warm there, goes right there for that light. This just beats that angle iron with the bolted on exposed light. Everything's inside. You'll see how we'll tie it in through conduit on the inside and later on in the video. And that's why we didn't need a marker light on the outside of that fender because you can see this basically lines up with that. And then we welded in a filler piece right there just to kind of help make it flare. But we added these D-rings at the back because inevitably you put two or three four-wheelers in the end, the last one sits right here on the back, so you're gonna want something to tie it down. All right, so we're working on the ramps of the trailer. We're gonna build some slides that go underneath. I happen to in a, find some recycled great flooring. It's got a little lip on the outside. Pay 20 bucks for these, you know, marketplace Craigslist. Otherwise, you can build them from scratch using angle iron. But you want to know the size of your ramp before you start building the ramp slides. There are so many different ones out there. Uh, so I like to have the ramp built and then dedicate it to this trailer. So 
we're going to go ahead and cut it in half. Now, if you notice, I've got it supported on both sides. What you don't want is put this on saw horses and have, as you cut it, it collapse in the middle because that caused some major kickback. So, safety first. And put some uh, catches on it or angle iron. Now that we got our ramps, hanger, and approach completed, I don't like the ramps that just lay up on the deck because you have to strap them or risk them sliding off. So that's one of the reasons I put this 2x2 two two angle iron on the front, welded it from the top and the bottom. And then you can see down here at the bottom, I put a scrap of a 5 inch rail, 3 inches or 2.5 inches on, 2.5 inches off. That makes it a little bit easier approach. That way if you need to load this with a two wheel dolly or something like that, these ramps work really great for that. Now, we got to figure out how we're going to store these. Well, we've already figured it out. We want to be able to slide them right underneath. So, the easiest way to do that is just to build a hanger below. But we've got all this room up here, plus we want to keep our clearance higher. So, we're not going to do it the easy way. We're at least going to notch out this 2x2 two two rail right here and then put some stringers or supports off of the inch and a half tubing. You can do it piece by piece, but I'd rather not work and have to weld a overhead. Uh, a little more comfortable, a little easier to see what's going on. So I'm going to tack get each one of these, flip it over, make sure everything's right. And then we'll add the hangers and go from there. We're going to use 2x2 two two angle for that with inch and a quarter hangers. The ramps are about an inch and three quarters thick, so that'll work out real well for the two inch. They are 10 inches wide with a little lip on the side. So we're going to make these 10 and 3 quarters, 10 and a half, somewhere in that range. That way they won't, if they slide side to side, they won't come out while you're going down the road. Put a stop bracket or bar in there to keep it from going up too far, making it more of a challenge to get out. To install the ramp, you're by yourself. Using the axle as a support, and I'm going to give this a tack. After a bunch of welding, that's the stops like it should. We're on to our last phase of welding for this trailer. It's going to be, we got to figure out some way to keep the ramps attached and hooked up to the top. There's multiple ways that you can contain a ramp and simplest throw it back in the truck and you can avoid all this. But I, I like how they're always with the trailer. Um, they do make these spring-loaded catches, they lock open, and I was going to use them, but with the style of ramp that I created, the ramp's going to be sticking out two or three inches before this even catches, and I just don't like that. What I've done in the past is taken a couple one to two inch pieces of angle iron and put a tab at the top and the bottom of the ramp holder and just drop a hitch pin or a tractor pin through there. This one I'm going to go a little bit simpler. Um, we're just going to put a single and then we're going to drop this clevis pin through there. You are going it for trailer use. It would have been really close trying it. That would have been three and a half. I think we could have went with that pin, but they only make them two and three quarters at the store I was at. So down the road, if I find a longer one, that's what I might do because I like that full. But we're going to cut these off, kind of give it a little more rounded look. But again, this will be hidden when, or at least not as obvious. It won't stick out any, too far when the ramp rail is up. So this and this don't stick out any further. Let's, let's move on to the ramp rail. All right, as I mentioned, I'm not a big fan of the ramps that just set up on there because, you know, if the tires spin out or whatever, they can pull the uh, ramp down, so you've got to strap them. So typically my ramps, which they do in this case, also have the hook. But once the deck level's out here, you're going to have no place to hook them. So what we're going to do is take a piece of inch and a quarter angle iron and make a hook. So we're going to use these woodworking uh, right angle clamps 
Just kind of hold that in place. Now I've got eight of these little inch and a halfers. Now we're going to take and point them there. That'll hold this up from curling and rolling. And that's just done with inch and a half long pieces of the cutoff from this piece. They'll be welded vertically every 16, 24 inches, whatever. You see fit, we'll probably put one on the end. On each side of the ramps, we'll probably put three real quick. And we'll do a couple in the middle and put three over there. So we'll end up doing eight. The more the merrier, it sucks putting them on, but you're better off having more support when you got the welder out than being at the end of a trip or the beginning of a trip wishing you had added more. And now you can't get the ATVs off the trailer. So always think ahead. Do more now while you got the setup. All right, that's how the ramp all works. They're basically level with the top. So we've done some grinding, some uh, flat wheeling, kind of cleaned everything up, and it's ready to go to get its primer coat and gloss or Rust-Oleum black paint. When it comes back, we'll worry about the wiring, which we're going to do before the deck's on, and then we'll finish up with the deck and be ready to haul some four-wheelers. All right, it's been a long day of putting the other side on. Now we're moving on to some of the pre-wiring setup. You don't have to go to the extent of putting everything in conduit, but where do trailers fail? The jacks, the wheel bearings, and the wiring. So by keeping all the wiring in conduit, what we do is we use an open back electrical box welded to the frame around each light socket, and then use a combination of plastic, metal, and even plumbing fitting parts to make our wiring go from one extreme to the other. I've got a uh, more intense video on how to wire a trailer and the techniques that I use, but this one we're just going to get started by tacking this front. The wiring is going to come down the, the driver's side and then it'll box up here on my left and this will get it over to the front marker light on this side. We could just zip tie across, but that's when the mud, the snow, the rain, that's what causes it all to sag, which is why we're going with this metal conduit. So I sized it up. And for the flexible, you want to have a little bit of room to do your bends. And that's the nice thing about these wire hangers is you can adjust it left to right. These steel boxes, galvanized, zinc steel, whatever they are, they seem to work just fine. Again, they're not truly watertight, but I have used them in on our snow four-wheeler trailers that we take from snow removal sites, and it's no lighting problems. If there's a lighting problem, it's in the box. It's actually the light fixture not working. All right, we're back. The trailer just got itself its fresh coat of primer and paint. I want to send a shout out to my son and his friends from youth group in high school that did an excellent job of that. Now we're going to move on to the wiring phase. So again, the reason I choose to do the conduit the full route is because of the snow, the mud, the sticks, the terrain that I'm driving my trailers on, and just the peace of mind. So it starts with a seven-way junction box and a pre-wired seven-way molded plug or a four-wire or a six-wire, whatever your truck matches. You do you, this is the way I do it. Another thing that I like to use is chromated lights. Surface mount tend to get busted a little bit more, but the same policy would apply or same procedures would apply with surface mount light. So we're going to start up front. We've drilled a three quarter hole in, through the frame here, and we're going to slide our light in. And the rubber grommet goes, there's a kind of an indentation, set that in there, and then the light should slide into that. Amber's up front, red's in the rear, amber's along the side, just in case you're not familiar with DOT lighting code. Now what I've done is there's a junction box right here that runs up to the seven way. And from here we've run an elbow and a piece of flexible conduit to a T, 
which runs out to this two-way wire, and then it'll split off to that. So my junction box for the two front lights is right here. We'll unscrew this. We will use a heat shrink solder connection and take care of that. And we'll do the same here with some flexible wire sheeting to keep all that protected. And we'll use a multitude of connectors. You may not agree with them all. Soldering is the best, but that's time consuming and sometimes overkill. So you do you, what works best for you. I'm gonna show you a couple variety of ways here. One of the things that we're definitely going to reuse is the trailer plug and the first six feet that came with it. I know this works because we've tested it or pull, we tested it pulling the trailer before we tore it apart so we know that this all works and I'm a big fan of these pre-wired plugs they either have a six or an eight foot uh, line on them trying to do all the connections inside of here is a challenge and get it all put back together not impossible but a challenge and I think it's a little bit more durable when you're not relying on set screws to hold everything together then underneath the toolbox here is the seven-way junction box, which I'll show you how that goes together at the end. That's one of the last things I do so I can test as I go, so I don't short anything out. The first thing we need to do, though, is determine are we using RV wiring or are we using utility trailer wiring? And my guess, we haven't done the test yet, my guess would be that we're going to use RV wiring on the plug However, I'm going to really confuse you and use trailer wiring, utility trailer wiring on the, on the actual trailer because that's what the four wire strand comes. Up on the screen should be a diagram of the two comparisons. Why the RV industry and the utility trailer industry can't get together and match their colors up, it is what it is. Most vehicles are what the seven way RV plug as they call it will be tagged RV. But we're going to make sure by using uh, the actual truck and the a voltmeter to determine which system we're using. So let's get that set up. We have, as you can tell, an RV wire plug because it's got the larger power wire, which is black. It's got the larger ground wire, 10 or 12 gauge for the white. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our prong and Stick it into the white wire from our voltmeter. Turn that on. And what we've got on the truck, you want to be careful doing this because you can short circuit some things out by letting it touch the metal. If you notice, I haven't got anything stripped back because I can use the prongs. And we're going to touch the green or the brown and find out if we're using utility trailer wiring or if we're using RV style wiring on this plug. And I'm going to brown. I have no volts. So what I suspected, and when I go to green, you hear the beep, and it's going to, you know, a little over 12 volts, which is normal between 12 and 14, will be normal. That's saying that's the marker. So we can go through the rest of the test, which we've done off camera. So we determined that. We'll use the seven-way junction box to connect the two colors together. Just have to keep your notes and everything straight, but at least it won't be a gobbled mess if someone else had to work on the trailer for you they'd be able to see the difference and the setup there inside this bag of this box I drilled a hole that matched the knockout size so there's another one of those wire clamps again if something was to catch this wire underneath there it would only pull out from the junction box or the light fixture so you don't be down one light if something happened from a debris standpoint. What we have here is a right angle threaded PVC plumbing pipe. We left it a little bit loose so we can get some flexibility there. It's one of these. Okay, so it's from the plumbing section. That's what's nice. The conduit and plumbing fittings work together. The advantage to the white PVC, which is what this is on this down here, is the wall's a little thinner so it's a little more flexible. They're about the same price. You want a little bit of this around, it's going to be hard to make this all fit together without having some flexible conduit. It is possible, but it's a lot more planning involved. What we did is took, we made our junction right here. So we had to extend the wire to get from the outside to the, this junction box, so that's all sealed. 
And then what you can't see inside this box, there's a locking cable collar. And we got a, a ring for a zip tie. That's inside the box. All right, we'll give these a couple minutes to cool down and go ahead and wrap them with the color-coded corresponding electrical tape, close that up. But in the meantime, since none of them are touching each other, we can go ahead and go back up front and hook up the battery box and see if we've got solid connections before we do all that. Turn the power on. Lights on. One way that's usually taboo in trailer wiring is just to twist them together like this. However, personal opinion again, it, it works. And the reason we're using the twist and wire nut method is because brakes get serviced. And if they need to get replaced, then you have to cut the wire and the wire gets shortened and eventually you run out of wiring. So really get them to twist up like that and then we'll wrap them with the corresponding tape color and tuck them away. You do want to wrap them in tape for corrosion, not only, but uh, vibration. They'll want to have a tendency to want to come loose so that helps. You don't have to use the color-coded tape, but it sure makes it easier when you're dissecting problems or diagnosing problems on the side of the road. So you got one wire that comes across, one wire for this brake, one wire that sends it to the other brake. That's why there's three in there. There we go. On to the back. All right, here we are. We're working on the back of the trailer. This is where we you light them up like a Christmas tree back here. The three marker lights in the middle, that is a interpretable dis dispute. I don't know how many trailer manufacturers get away with it, but again, it's all interpretation and enforcement. If the trailer is over 80 inches wide, to my knowledge, and comment if I'm incorrect, but if the trailer is over 80 inches wide, it does require the three identification lights. A lot of interpretation goes into is the deck over 80 inches wide or the trailer over 80 inches wide because this is technically considered a 6 by 16 trailer. But by the time you throw the fenders on there, we are at 7 foot 4 or something like that. So that's over 80 inches wide. Just to be on the safe side, you put them on there. I like them anyways. They kind of add more visibility, add more flair to the trailer. I typically go with the dime lights. That way everything's recessed behind the ramp bar. Same thing with the light boxes on the sides. I like the boxes rather than exposed wiring, damage, getting caught on tree branches, grounds, driveways, backed into things. There's a lot of reasons to spend the extra money. These are about $30 a piece and get the light boxes put on the side. The other advantage to using the grommet style or some of them actually have rings that screw in is they have a quick connect plug so it makes it easy to replace if you have a problem. This is considered a four inch round, takes a four and a quarter or four and a half, I can't remember the size hole. Um, really easy to install because you get the hole saw or a torch and cut out the circle you need. Now a lot of these plugs have a eyelet to screw it to the metal frame. I'll do that up front. I like having all of my ground connected to one point. Um, it will save a wire. However, you've got multiple points where your ground can be corroded. Yes, it'll only affect one light versus all of them. It's a never ending debate. I've had better luck with all of it being sealed and then it being grounded up front. Grounded, it also is grounded to the truck. So even if the one ground point corroded, having the connected to the ground wire there helps everything stay connected. So this gets all tucked in there. 
That's why these boxes are nice. You don't have to strain yourself to get the wiring done. Feed that through. You're not reaching your hands inside too much. On these, there's a ring right here. And you need to make sure it snaps around the box. That's why the hole size is critical. And this should only go in one way. I've already attached some dielectric grease to it. Yep, they only go in one way. All prongs to line up. And then a little bit of a love tap there, and everything snaps into place. So far, we're just testing markers. We're good there. We're good at the fenders, and we're good up front. All right, when it comes to the three markers in the middle, we're going to use, again, the same. So then people call them penny lights or dime lights. And we're going to use the bullet connectors. So on each side of these, it makes it easy to replace down the line if they were to get damaged or backed into or hit with a ramp or a four-wheeler. So again, plan ahead now. A few extra cents on a connector will make changing a light on the road a lot easier. All right, all the wiring is done from the junction box back. So I'm going to head up there and turn it on. Welcome back. We're on the final steps of getting this thing lit up like a Christmas tree. As you can see, we have wired the about 90% of the trailer is in conduit. There's very little exposed wiring. And if there is, it's, it's wrapped and sheathed for, as protected as we can. We gotta, we're using this to haul four wheelers, most likely. So we're going to be off road, campgrounds, farms, you know, grass fields, sticks, debris. Plus you got rainwater, snow, salt, mud, all that crap that can hang on the wires and pull things out. So that's the big advantage to taking the time, the little bit of extra expense. $100 on a $1,000 trailer is not, I know it's 10%, but that's 10% less worry. It's probably 100% less worry about your wiring down the road. So we have used our battery box to test each light individually. So that way we knew if we had a problem, which, which connection it was basically within and not having to research the whole trailer. The other thing that we really, or I really use a lot is these seven way junction boxes. On a smaller trailer like a four by eight, five by 10, even a six by 12, something that doesn't have brakes, I'll just use a double gang junction box with a cap and just kind of wire nut or solder shrink everything together. But the advantage to this is we're gonna have multiple grounds because we got the trailer ground, we got the, the plug ground, and we got the brake ground. They can all go on one stud. We've also got multiple sized wires because the, we're using an RV plug because that's what the camper was or trailer was. So we got a larger ground and so we could, we've got room to work. The other thing is we have connection points that snap in and the cover will close and again keep everything tight. So there's advantages. The boxes range from $15 to $25. Sometimes you, for less than $50, you can get a plug with them too. So, I, again, if, you, if I didn't reiterate this earlier, a pre-wired plug, trying to make the connections in here are real tight, real space constrained, and a lot of times that's where you have problems is right here at the plug. So having them pre-wired, molded, heat shrunk together at a factory, less problems here. This way you can do all your testing here with the junction box down the line, even on the side of the road. So be careful when you're stripping the wire, the sheathing. You don't want to damage. They do make special tools with it. This is one I don't have. Basically the analogy I like to use on this, it's like trying to pack for a one month trip and you're limited to one suitcase. So there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in here. Utilize the lengths of the wires to make everything work. Now the trick we got to remember in this is we have RV plug color configuration, we have utility trailer plug configuration. So as long as you got your notes, they end up on the right stud based on their purpose. Color doesn't matter as long as the purpose matches up.
So once you've figured out your length, give those a little twist, slide on the connector, make sure I've had pretty good luck with these crimpers. Just make sure you get good metal contact. There we go. You gotta watch out for your two mounting brackets. So we're just gonna go ahead and take care of our trailer wire from the truck. Let's get that out of the way first. These are brake wires. I'm gonna go ahead and label them with blue tape just to help remind yourself down the road what these might be. Break negative, we'll go on the negative for the trailer. And the brake positive will go on the blue to the brake. What's nice if I get these mixed up, you just unbolt it and move it. As long as you don't have a ground where you, you shouldn't. And that's why the ground is always white. Cinch them up, but don't over tighten them, it's just plastic. Make sure all these are in. There we are. Well, as you can see, we're already putting the trailer to work. So the fact that we use it to go get the deck lumber means it's time to put the deck lumber on. We're using 2x8 pressure treated lumber for our deck and material, a rough cut around 16 foot, 16 one. So we'll get a final measurement here, use the circ saw to cut them to size. We will apply a sealer. Either one of my sealer choices is a bed liner or straight up deck sealer, just depends on what is the best price or what I have around. And then I like to put a deck sealer on the top that can always be replaced. Most treated lumber still helps it out. That's one of those optional steps you need to do. Let's get this deck put on. Now what we do is we start from the outside and work our way in. We pull, we clamp it tight to the outside rail. Then we'll put some spacers in between, clamp the next one to the first, that board. And then once we get to the middle, we will calculate what we need to rip the two center boards to. That's my procedure. I use the Trex or Tech, excuse me, I use the Tex two and three quarter board or screws. They have a self drilling tip, but I find it much easier if you go ahead and pre drill a smaller hole, especially the thicker the steel, the easier it's going to get in. So take advantage of the pre drilling opportunity. board foot estimated about 2,500 pounds of lumber strap points especially the ones here on the fender they paid off putting those on hopefully you got something out of this video if you like the, this one give it a thumbs up otherwise obviously you can tell we do trailer videos but they're primarily woodworking so if, they, if you've liked what we've shown you so far be sure to hit that subscribe button hit that bell for notifications all I have to say is, go out and make some sawdust.